The Warhammer 40k universe paints one of the darkest futures for humanity out of all the sci-fi franchises out there. Mankind has long since spread its wings into the stars from Terra, Earth, colonizing many different worlds. These worlds had operated independently for millennia, with some even forgetting that they belonged to a much larger species with their origins tied to Earth. This would all change when the Emperor of Mankind, after uniting Terra under his banner, embarked on his great crusade into the galaxy to assimilate the fragmented human species into his empire known as the Imperium of Man. After successfully bringing most of humanity under his rule, with the aid of his sons, the Primarchs and the Astartes or Space Marines, the Emperor would be betrayed. This betrayal would come at the hands of some of his own Primarchs who, under his favorite son, Horus Luprical would rebel, having been corrupted by the ruinous forces of the Immaterium. The Immaterium, or the Warp as it's commonly known, was an alternate dimension filled with the energy of the collective consciousness of all the sentient beings in the universe. This place coexisted alongside the material world and was home to the insidious gods of chaos and their demonic minions, among other beings born from the various sentient consciousness that fuel this space. The Emperor of Mankind would be mortally wounded, even as the Loyalist forces would win the day through a Pyrrhic victory. The Loyalist forces would place the Emperor upon his golden throne in Terra, which was nothing but a glorified life support system. With most of the Primarchs either dead, lost, or corrupted, the High Lords of Terra would take up the reins of this mighty empire. The once proud and glorious Imperium would slowly devolve into a decaying machinery filled with superstition and bureaucracy. While once the Emperor chastised the now traitor Primarch Lorgar Aurelian and his legion, the world bearers, for treating the ruler of mankind as divinity, which led them to fall to chaos, the Imperium after his fall would ironically transform into a theocratic empire with him as the God Emperor of mankind. This is where the characters who were the focus of our video today come in. The Chaplains While the Imperium and their military wing, the Astro Militarum, are filled with extreme zealots who would go to any lengths to show their faith toward the Emperor, very few can match the fervor of the Chaplains that belong to the various Adaptus Astartes chapters. While this office was established long before the Horus Heresy took place, its role has become even more important since then. The Chaplain is the spiritual core of his chapter, and the bastion against the corrupting influences of chaos. If one is familiar with other works of fantasy, he is Warhammer's version of a paladin, a warrior priest that'll extol the virtues of his religion while kicking demon butt at the same time. They're selected from the most devout space marines who are believed to have unwavering faith in the Emperor of Mankind. With more than 50 space marine chapters having defected from the Imperium since the Horus heresy over the millennia, it's imperative for the Imperium and the Adeptus Astartes to have great chaplains amongst their troops. In this video, we're going to be doing one of our deep dives into this extremely important role and some of the people who have held this rank, along with its various variants. We'll also be talking about the cool weapons and war gear that these battle priests wear, along with their history and their place amongst their battle brothers. So strap in as we dive into the unforgiving world of Warhammer 40k and discover more about the Chaplains, arguably one of the most fanatical warriors of the Space Marines, and may the Emperor guide our path. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Tens of thousands of years ago, the elven lawmaster named Rumil of Tyrion wrote the definitive piece of work that detailed a period known as the First Age. <laughs> Who are the chaplains in the Warhammer 40k universe? A brief history. During the 31st century, the Emperor of Mankind would convene a great war council on the planet of Nikea. This was done primarily to address the growing concern about the use of psychic abilities and sorcery that the Imperium had begun to come across as the Great Crusade progressed. In the Warhammer 40k universe, those born with these psychic abilities are known as psychers, and they draw their power from the Immaterium. They do this by either tapping directly into this vortex of energy, or by making deals with the intelligent denizens that dwell within it. These psychers were often ignorant about the dangers of making deals with such unknown entities and delving into the warp post to them and the world they lived in. During the Great Crusade, the Imperium came across several worlds that had been tainted and corrupted by the forces of Chaos, who used these psychers as a medium to invade the material world. The psychers, having the power to access the Immaterium, proved to be easy conduits for these malevolent beings to possess and use for their nefarious purposes. There were also instances where these psychers, drunk with power, 
had taken over the planets they lived in and essentially established cults to the ruinous powers. While the Emperor himself was the greatest psyche ever to exist, he viewed humanity as not yet advanced enough to control and deal with the powers and risks that having these abilities brought with it. Thanks to Magnus the Red, the Primarch of the Thousand Suns Legion of Space Marines who had inherited his father's, the Emperor's psychic abilities to the most significant degree, almost every Space Marine Legion had warriors known as librarians within their ranks. These librarians were not just mere record keepers of the deeds and history of the Legions, but also Space Marine psychers who used their special abilities against the forces of the Imperium. Many Legions of Space Marines by this time had integrated these librarians into their system and battle tactics and used them extensively against their foes. There were two arguments being made at the Council of Nikea, one for the use of psychic abilities and the other against it. The likes of Sisters of Silence and Primarchs such as Mortarian and Leman Rus stood in staunch opposition, while the other side that was for a more measured approach to its use was led by Magnus the Red. The former group pointed out the numerous atrocities they'd encountered in various worlds thanks to the psychers and their dabbling with the forces of the Immaterium. Magnus, on the other hand, spoke with the charisma of a Primarch about the benefits of sorcery and psychic abilities to the Imperium. He made the case that sorcery was merely a tool that could be used for either good or evil, depending on the disposition of the individual wielding it. The Emperor is said to have listened in silence as all parties made their case. The Council of Nikea was, however, as much a trial of Magnus as it was a gathering to decide the fate of sorcery. When evidence was brought in front of the Emperor about the depth to which Magnus had started delving into the use of sorcery by engaging the forces of the Immaterium, the Emperor was wrathful. Long ago, he shared with Magnus the secrets of the warp and the entities that dwelt within them, as well as their dangers to humanity. The Emperor had done so, trusting Magnus with these secrets over all his other sons including his chosen and favorite, Horus. He therefore felt betrayed by Magnus and made a decision that would have far larger ramifications for the future of the Imperium than anyone anticipated. The Emperor decreed that all psychers, including the librarians of the Adeptus Astartes, were to be banned and outlawed. Other than the state-sanctioned astronomers and navigators, which were closely controlled by the Imperium, the librarians had to rejoin their battle brothers as normal space marines. This rule stood for well over 10,000 years, up until the Horus Heresy, when everyone realized that librarians were needed to combat the forces of chaos. Anticipating that some of the Primarchs would not adhere to this ruling because, for many of them, their legion's battle strategies heavily relied on the librarians, Malkador, the Sigilite, who was the right-hand man of the Emperor, proposed the introduction of the chaplains. He drew on this idea from Lorgar Aurelian and his word-bearer legion. The chaplains selected would be the most fervent and devout space marines who held an unwavering allegiance to the Emperor and the Primarchs, along with the unique beliefs of their own legions and later chapters. They were meant to uphold the tenets of the Imperial Truth, tend to the spiritual needs of the Space Marines, and maintain the Legion's dedication and faith in the Emperor. Their primary purpose, at least during their inception, was to ensure that the rule on the ban of Psyche was enforced in all the Legions of the Space Marines at the time. Lorgar Aurelian, whose Legion was the first to extol the Emperor as a divinity for humanity to worship, already had chaplains within their ranks. To ease the transition of the legions through the abolishment of the office of the librarian to the introduction of the chaplain, the Primarch offered his own chaplains to serve under these various legions. The word bearers had however all fallen to chaos secretly after they were humiliated by the Emperor for not following the atheist doctrines of the imperial truth and establishing churches in the name of the ruler of mankind. The events of the Council of Nikea were therefore watched by the fallen Primarch with much bemusement and irony and it allowed him to infiltrate the various legions of his brothers in an attempt to corrupt them. He would indeed succeed, and the chaplain Erebus of the word bearers that had been assigned to the Sons of Horus would successfully twist and corrupt Horus Lupercal, leading to the most tragic and infamous event in the history of the Imperium, called the Horus Heresy. This event would see the Emperor turned into a living corpse, with more than half of the Primarchs and their legions defecting to chaos. The remaining Primarchs would be either dead, comatose, or lost, leaving the Imperium on the brink of destruction, from which it's hardly recovered till its present day. This was the origin of the chaplains, and though they exist even now in all Space Marine chapters, their roles have been somewhat altered due to the lifting of bans on all combat psychers within the Adapters Astartes since the heresy. What's the role of a chaplain within the chapter and in battle? The importance of chaplains within a Space Marine chapter only lies below that of the Primarch and a chapter master, both of whom are responsible for the functioning of the chapter as a whole. The chaplains are meant to address the spiritual needs of their battle brothers. Their job is to aid the chapter master in keeping up the morale and integrity of the chapter. It's also their job to pray and do the necessary rituals that the chapter they belong to believes in, and they function essentially as priests in this regard. To this end, the chaplains are well versed in the various liturgies and scriptures required to fulfill this duty. 
Though religious in nature, a chaplain only has very loose ties with the Imperium's Ecclesiarchy. The Ecclesiarchy is a much newer organization that ironically replicates the faith preached initially by the traitor, Primarch Lorgar Aurelian, which led him down the path of chaos. They view the Emperor as a living god and a zealous fanatics. The Space Marines, however, hold great disdain for them, as Astartes believe that they were there right from the beginning, with the Emperor doing his will, and that they don't need mere fanatics to guide their paths. This feeling is mutual, as the Ecclesiarchy holds the Space Marine in equal contempt, blaming them for the current state of the Emperor. The Chaplain treads a tenuous middle ground as the only fragile bridge between the Adaptus Astartes and the Ecclesiarchy to show that they serve the same cause and Emperor. The Space Marines are already fanatically loyal to their Emperor, but as shown from events in the past, they're not infallible to corruption. This is the reason chaplains who are chosen from the most fanatical and devout of these already fanatical warriors are held in great respect and awe by their peers. It's their job to guide their brothers on the correct path and make sure that they adhere to the teachings of the Codex Astartes. Thanks to the chaplains, the Space Marine chapters breathe easy knowing that the corrupting influence of chaos is kept at bay from them. One of their primary duties is the indoctrination of the neophytes, or rookie Space Marines, into the chapter's way of functioning and belief. These neophytes will eventually rise to the rank of a fully-fledged battle brother of the chapter and carry on the tradition and legacy. This point alone can't overstate how important a chaplain is to the existence and well-being of a chapter. During the trial to become a Space Marine, it's the chaplains who inculcate the culture and values of the chapters within these new aspirants. They're also responsible for weeding out the spiritually weak or the ones lacking in faith to become Astartes and serve the Emperor. Meeting the spiritual needs of an entire chapter, along with guiding fledgling super soldiers down the right path, is no easy task. As such, the chaplains have an important role to play in the Adapters Astartes chapter and the Imperium as a whole. Their roles are, however, not limited to being mere priests or the spiritual pillars for their chapters, as they are, at the end of the day, still Space Marines. This means they're capable of putting a bolter or cleaving through the flesh with a chainsaw of any Xenos, heretic, or mutant that stands in their way of delivering the Emperor's divine justice. If one's looking for one of these warrior priests in battle, then one must turn to where the fighting is at its fiercest, for there one will see the chaplain in all his glory. The chaplains can be seen reciting the various scriptures of the chapter's faith as if in a religious frenzy, even as they smite the enemies of humanity into a bloody mess. They can also be seen administering aid to their wounded and offering prayers to the deceased in the midst of the chaos and fighting that surrounds them. They thrive in battle, as they feel it's the ultimate crucible for them to show their faith to the Emperor. The sight of them in battle and their deeds drive the rest of their battle brothers into a frenzy and raise their morale, even in the direst situations. From being a spiritual pillar and indoctrinating its initiates with the values and cultures of the chapter, to inspiring them on the battlefield to go above and beyond their limits and perform acts of valor, the chaplain's role both within the chapter and on the battlefield is invaluable. The spiritual backbone of the Adeptus Astartes, Chaplains, and the Reclusium. The chaplains can be usually found within a part of the chapter's fortress monastery, or primary battle barge known as the Reclusium. The Reclusium is considered to be the chaplain's office and is the establishment's central shrine. It contains within it various relics, armor fragments, and weapons of the chapter's heroes from their history. It also contains various other trophies and banners captured from their fallen foes over the millennia. It's often considered to be the chapter's holiest site. The Reclusium is where the chapter gathers to attend the prayer service conducted by the chaplains who hold the rank of Reclusiarch and Master of Sanctity. Here they read out the various liturgies and remind the rest of the chapters about their sacred duties toward their Emperor and the virtues of serving the Imperium of Man. These are the two chaplains who are mostly responsible for the spiritual development of their chapters, because the rest of them are deployed alongside their battle brothers on the front lines. However, the most important teaching of a chaplain is that prayers and praise to the Emperor need not be offered only within the confines of the Reclusium. In the heat of battle, as they shred their enemies with bolt arounds and cover the earth with their blood, the screaming agony of their foes and the sounds of their weapons are as good as any hymns or prayers that they can offer within the Reclusium. This is their greatest act of prayer and the fulfillment of their sacred duty towards the Imperium and their master that they can perform. Reclusium Command Squad, Guardians of the Chaplain and Spiritual Heart of the Space Marines. Having discussed how the chaplains, despite being priests, are, at the end of the day, Space Marines who love expounding on the virtues of the Imperium and the Emperor by drowning the earth with the blood of their foes, there are occasions when these fanatical warriors find themselves a bit too into the thick of things. During such dire times, a special command force called the Reclusium Command Squad is assembled to protect the chaplain at all costs. It's made out of the finest warriors in the chapter and serves as a rallying point in the heat of battle for the Space 
Space Marines. This squad, usually comprised of Space Marines who were veterans of countless warfare, put their bodies on the line so that the chaplain can continue his functions in the heat of battle that we discussed in the earlier segment. This just goes to further illustrate how vital the role of a chaplain is in the battle to keep the morale of the troops high even when facing insurmountable odds. The warriors who make up the Reclusium command squad are called Reclusiaries while fulfilling this duty. With the enormity of their task and the chaplain being right next to them, these Reclusiaries are the ones who are most affected by the battle sermons of the chaplains. This increases their effectiveness and battle prowess several fold, making them nigh juggernauts in the field of battle while executing their duty. Besides the chaplain, a Reclusium squad normally consists of the following personnel. Apothecary. An apothecary is a battle medic, and we'd like to really emphasize the battle part of his title, for he too is a space marine, and is primarily a death-dealing machine, just like his brothers. Like most medics, though, he also functions to provide aid and succor to his battle brothers who need it. With most battles in the 40k universe already being more brutal than one can even imagine, it takes a special apothecary to be a part of the Reclusium Command Squad, which is usually where the battle is the thickest and most dire. Standard Bearer. The Standard Bearers are often given the title of Ancients, as they are comprised of some of the most grizzled veterans of a Space Marine chapter. The Space Marine Standard, or Banner, is one of the most hallowed artifacts of their chapter, having been flown over hundreds of worlds and battlefields. The significance of the intricate designs on the Banner is very well understood by every member of the corresponding chapter, and it serves to provide them with a great boost in morale and energy. Being a veteran of countless campaigns, the Standard Bearer's battle prowess is also not to be underestimated, as there's a reason he's earned the right to uphold such holy artifacts and relics. His presence in the Reclusium Command Squad grants another layer of experience and a morale boost when things hit the roof. Company Champion A Company Champion is one of the strongest warriors in a Space Marine chapter, especially adept at duels. They step forward to take on challenges in the name of the Chaplain, much like they would for their company's captain. In extremely rare cases, they also get bestowed with the honorable role of performing certain important duties within the Reclusium itself, not just on the battlefield. Razorback. Due to the need for the Reclusium squad to either enter quickly where the fighting is the thickest or exit from there, the Razorback tank proves to be a valuable asset in this regard. It's an armored personnel carrier that's been modified from the Rhino, which sees widespread service in the numerous battlefields of the Imperium. Unlike the Rhino, the Razorback can be outfitted with numerous weapons, such as the twin-linked heavy bolters and the twin-linked last cannon, greatly adding to its firepower and versatility in battle formidable armor and iconic appearance of the chaplains. The chaplain has perhaps one of the most distinct and iconic looks out of all the units in the Space Marine chapter. They wear their iconic Space Marine helmets with a death mask that looks like a skull, and though they may vary in design depending on the chapter and the artificer who's crafted it, their intent and function are the same. They're meant to symbolize the Emperor's sacrifice to protect humanity by shedding his mortal coil and ascending as a divine being in the Immaterium. The skull is, in fact, a very dominant motif of a chaplain's armor, as it's seen on all the various parts of their armor. The chest piece of the armor is also sometimes cast in the visage of a skull. It also appears as an insignia on the shoulders of their armor. Despite this modification, the armor that the chaplains wear is just a slight variation of the standard issue power armor for all Astartes. They're normally issued variants of the Mark VI, Mark VII, Mark VIII, and even the newer Mark X power armor. Their armors are painted entirely black and adorned by icons of battle and death. They look less like priests and more like angels of death. A novice chaplain might have his helmet, right shoulders, and right arm of his armor painted black. Adorned in all black, the chaplain quickly draws the attention of both friends and foes to them in the thick of battle, thus making it easier for them to execute their duties. They're also carrying a relic from their Primarch, or one of their greatest heroes on them, and it's believed that doing so grants the chaplain some of the immense might of the hero the relic belongs to. Chaplains of the Death Guard are also known for wearing various Xenos artifacts, such as skulls, bones, and tanned skins of their fallen foes, which are adorned with hateful remembrance and liturgy. The chaplains also carry one of the treasured Rosarius, which is gifted to them by the Ecclesiarchy to symbolize their unity of faith despite their many differences. It's normally worn as an amulet around their neck or as a gorget. The most common form of these rosarius is that of a crux terminatus, which appears as a gothic cross embellished with precious stones and metals. It is, however, no ordinary trinket as the rosarius is capable of producing a powerful protective conversion field that renders all attacks, both physical and psychic, useless against its wielder. It provides the chaplains with an additional layer of protection against anything that manages 
manages to penetrate their mighty defenses, making them literal juggernauts. They're also adorned with purity seals and other tokens of faith to ward against the evils that they face in battle. The chaplains also wield a powerful staff, or mace, that doubles both as a symbol of their position and a weapon. This is called a Crozius Arcanum, and is surrounded by a powerful energy field, making it a devastating melee weapon in combat, giving it the properties of a power weapon. This is thanks to a powerful energy field generating device incorporated within the shaft of the Crozius. It's either shaped in the form of a staff or a mace, with dual Aquila of the Imperium, or the skull, representing the Emperor's sacrifice for mankind on its top end. It's not, however, unusual to see the iconography of these weapons change according to the chapter to which these chaplains belong. The Salamander chaplains might have the head of a dragon on their Crozius, while Ultramarine chaplains might have the head of a Tyranid. The chaplain cuts a fearsome figure in the heat of battle, taking the appearance of the visual representation of the Emperor's wrath and mercy, depending on who he's standing against. Nothing is as awe-inspiring as watching a chaplain in his all-black regalia, adorned from head to toe with various tokens of purity and hateful liturgy, chanting from the Holy Scriptures as he administers his duty in the heat of battle. War Gear of the Chaplains The war gear of the Chaplains is not just limited to the Crozius Arcanum. They're able to wield every single weapon that's issued to the rest of their battle brothers, as they are first and foremost space marines as well. These battle-hardened priests won't hesitate to destroy the Xenos, the heretics, and the mutants with everything they can get their hands on. From the bolters to the melter gun, everything is fair game. Besides the Rosarius and the Crozius, which we've already discussed earlier, these are some of the war gear of the Chaplains. Bolters. The bolter, or bolt gun, is one of the most iconic pieces of war gear that an Astartes carries with them. It's a very powerful anti-personnel firearm capable of firing explosive bolts that can penetrate even the strongest armor and shred their foes to pieces. This weapon comes in two different variants. The bolt pistol, which is a standard issue sidearm, and the heavy bolter, which is normally attached to vehicles. Power Swords The Power Sword is a weapon shaped like a traditional sword, often made out of adamantium, which can generate a powerful field very similar to that of Crozius. These weapons are capable of disrupting matter, allowing it to cut through virtually anything effortlessly. Crack Grenades Crack Grenades are incendiaries designed to punch a hole into the armor of the enemy, particularly bunkers and armored vehicles. They usually attach to the target with a magnetic plate. These grenades can also be used to penetrate the thick hide of a Tyranid. These are only some of the war gears that are accessible to the chaplains. They also have access to Terminator armor when the need for durability and firepower is greater than the need for maneuverability. Oftentimes, you can also see chaplains fighting with storm bolters, and melter and plasma weapons are equipped as well. As we mentioned earlier, the weapons don't really define the chaplain, because the chaplain himself is the weapon. The litanies of battle that empower space marines. Remember how we told you the chaplains are constantly shouting and chanting from the scriptures and liturgies to boost the morale of their battle brothers? There are some very specific things that they're shouting, and not just random battle cries. These are known as the litanies of battle that empower their fellow space marines and themselves. Litany of Faith The chaplain cries out this litany to his battle brothers so that they can prepare themselves against the onslaught of the enemy's weapons by putting their faith in the Emperor. This greatly bolsters their durability when under fire and increases their survivability. Catechism of Fire This is the litany that the chaplain preaches when there's a dire need for immense close-range firepower. It greatly increases their destructive prowess and fills his battle brothers with the strength of the righteous flame, decimating all that stands before them. Exhortation of Rage This litany is not directed towards his battle brothers, but to the enemies they're facing. This greatly reduces the morale of the enemy, making them more susceptible to all forms of attack, and further bolsters the attack and morale of the space marines who hear it, granting them additional attack power and sending them into a rage as they rush into their enemies, pushing them backward. This exhortation of rage greatly boosts the melee prowess of all the Astartes who hear it. Mantra of Strength Unlike the other litanies, which are either directed towards his enemies or friends, the Mantra of Strength is recited by the chaplain for his own benefit. He focuses on the purity of his bloodline inherited from the Primarch of his chapter, granting him a major boost in melee attacks and strength. The sight of him hacking his way through the enemies also has a massive inspiring effect on the rest of the troops. Recitation of Focus This litany is usually recited by the chaplain to his fellow space marines when he feels there needs to be an increase in their ranged accuracy. This litany can inspire the space marines to really increase their accuracy and hit all their targets, especially when they're overwhelmed or fatigued. 
canticles of hate. The chaplain roars in hatred towards the enemies of the Imperium as he leads his battle brothers onwards to destroy their foes. Very similar to the exhortation of rage in its effects, this litany is used to push the Space Marines to their limits, extracting every iota of strength and zeal from them. This is usually used either when the situation is too desperate or when the battle is close to being won. Either way, it provides a major boost to the Emperor's troops, and unlike the exhortation of rage that affected mostly melee combat, the canticles of hate boost the overall prowess of the Space Marines. The different variants of chapter chaplains explored. While chaplains are a mainstay of most adapters Astartes forces, some of the chapters have unique takes on the office that reflect their culture and belief, in addition to their commitment to the Emperor. Sometimes these unique variants coexist with regular chaplains or overtake all the responsibilities of a traditional chaplain. These are some of the chapters with some interesting variants that exist within the adapters Astartes. The Death Speaker. The Death Speakers are the chaplains of the Executioner chapter of the Space Marines, who are the successor chapters of the Imperial Fists. Unlike their parent legion, the Executioners don't believe in siege and defensive warfare, but prefer seeking out and slaughtering the foes of the Imperium. Their chapter has developed its own set of beliefs, and while they do believe in the divinity of the God Emperor, they have a strong dislike for the Ecclesiarchy and their beliefs, which according to them are petty superstitions meant to control the masses. The Death Speakers are arguably their most important officers, as their job is to record and extol the tallies of slaughter committed by the heroic dead of the chapter during holy feasts and memorial ceremonies. This is normally done within the hallowed halls of their temple fortress of Darkenvolt. Their rather important role is to maintain order within the often seemingly savage chapter, obsessed with slaughter and death. The Death Speakers also keep records of every battle fought by the chapter and impart this knowledge to all neophytes. Aside from these tasks, they act like any other chaplains as the spiritual guides for their battle brothers. One of the more unique traits of the Executioners is that they deploy up to three Death Speakers in their battle companies. They all report to the Reclusiarch, who's known as the Lord Speaker of the Dead. The Iron Fathers. The Iron Hands chapter doesn't have the chaplain's office within their ranks. Instead, they have specialized officers who perform the functions of chaplains, apothecaries, and tech marines all at once. The name given to these marines is Iron Father. A council of these Iron Fathers run the Iron Hands. They're trained on Mars by Adeptus Mechanicus, and their beliefs are deeply rooted in the teachings of the cult of the machines. As such, they don't really follow the doctrines of the Imperial Ecclesiarchy. They believe the Emperor to be their leader and an aspect of the Mechanicum's Omnissiah, also known as the Machine God. The Imperial cult, therefore, holds them in absolute contempt and doesn't provide them with Rosari, as they're a symbol of a chapter and their common faith in the Emperor. The Wolf Priests. These are the most venerated space wolves who only answer to the Great Wolf, the Chapter Master himself, and their lost Primarch, Lemon Russ. They combine the offices of both the Apothecary and the Chaplain. These Wolf Priests scour the death world of Fenris, the home planet of the Space Wolves, for potential candidates to join their ranks. They're responsible for the creation of these neophytes and caring for the gene seed of their fallen. The Wolf Priests are also responsible for performing the final rites for their fallen battle brothers. As such, they're the first and last face a Space Wolf sees during his sojourn as an Astartes. The Wolf Priests are said to be blessed with extraordinarily keen eyesight, as it's very rare for them to misidentify a potential candidate. It is said that no Fenrisian native has denied the call of a Wolf Priest, as they're said to bestow greatness upon the Chosen and hold the keys to the stars themselves. As such, the Wolf Priests play a very important role in the society of Fenris as well. The Interrogator Chaplain. The Dark Angels have within their rank the standard Codex-approved chaplains along with what they call the Interrogator Chaplains. These Interrogators are privy to the deepest, darkest secrets of the Dark Angels, including the Fallen Angels. They have to pass a secret test of faith, along with a convoluted ceremony that inducts them into the chapter's inner circle. Their presence is felt to be unsettling by even their own battle brothers, who are the subject of their continuous scrutinizing gaze. They'll go to any lengths to procure more information about a fallen angel's resorting to torture, bordering on what would be considered heretical. While most chaplains are loud and boisterous, inspiring their men with the various litanies, an interrogator chaplain of the Dark Angels is the opposite, quiet and intense, looking for the slightest hint of corruption. The strength and reputation of these interrogator chaplains can be gauged by how many black pearls adorn their rosarius. This is because they're allowed to add a single black pearl for every fallen angel that convinces them to repent. The Blood Angel Chaplains The Blood Angel Chaplains are, for all intents and purposes, standard chaplains found in all the chapters that adhere to the Codex but with a few additional roles. They are the only individuals who can communicate with their battle brothers who have been afflicted by the flaws of Sanguinus, their martyred Primarch. After their Horus heresy, with almost all of their gene seeds destroyed, 
Fresh gene seeds were created after taking new genetic samples from their deceased Primark. Those Marines who were created using these gene seeds were susceptible to acquiring a condition called the Black Rage. The Black Rage triggers a memory encoded in the genes of the Blood Angels, making them relive the unbridled rage and fury of their Primark, which he felt in his battle with the traitor Horus before his death. Once a Battle Brother succumbs to this condition, it's next to impossible to revert its effect, as they become rage-fueled individuals enhanced slightly with the power of their Primark, unable to recognize friend from foe. The other condition, known as Red Thirst, basically triggers an insatiable desire for human blood in a blood angel. While there are some who can suppress their desires, many become feral and lose all control. These afflicted individuals are put into companies known as the Death Company and sent on arduous missions with almost no chance of survival so that they can achieve a quick and honorable death for the Emperor. The only people, as stated earlier, able to grant them a modicum of direction are the chaplains, making them an integral part of the chapters, as these two afflictions are the greatest kept secrets of the Blood Angels. The Dark Apostles These are the original chaplains of the Imperium whom Malkador the Sigilite used as a template to create the office of the chaplains. Now fallen to chaos, they serve the same function as their loyalist counterparts, but their worship is directed towards the ruinous powers. These fallen chaplains are now known as Dark Apostles. After their Primarch Lorgar's disappearance, these Dark Apostles hold the most extraordinary power and influence within their chapter. They're often seen preaching their propaganda fanatically against the Imperium and the Emperor. The Dark Gods have granted these Apostles various abilities, including the ability to summon daemons. They too wield the Crozius Arcanum, although just like them it's been twisted and corrupted, and is now called an Accursed Crozius. The Role of Death Watch Chaplains Explored We've discussed all there is to know about chaplains and the various versions of them that exist within the chapters of the Space Marines. The role of a Death Watch Chaplain involves a number of challenges that the chaplains or their counterparts don't have to face. For starters, the Death Watch is part of the Inquisition's Ordo Zeno's wing, tasked with protecting the Imperium from the horrors of alien threats such as Tyranids, Dark Eldar, Orca, and Necrons. They're comprised of veteran warriors from every possible loyalist chapter out there. As such, working together with coordination and putting aside old rivalries and beliefs can prove challenging. What's even more challenging is as a chaplain to be the spiritual and moral authority of these disjointed space marines. Also, during their missions, the Death Watch warriors bear witness to some of the most horrific Xenos-related things that can break even the strongest of minds. A Death Guard chaplain must be well-versed enough to know what to recite to his battle brothers in the face of such unspeakable horrors so they can regain their sanity and morale. Most chaplains don't qualify to become Death Guard chaplains as they have very narrow-minded views regarding their beliefs. It's what makes the chaplains such beacons of spirituality and direction within their respective chapters. As a Death Guard chaplain, one must be able to accept and cater to a myriad of beliefs, along with being able to take in some painful secrets and truths that border at being heretical. He must know the ritual, customs, and rites of every Astartes legion and chapter to have ever existed, so that he can administer to his battle brothers precisely according to their needs. This is no ordinary task, as some chaplains spend their entire lifetime learning the history, customs, and culture of a single chapter to which they belong. Getting appointed into the Death Guard is considered a great honor among the Astartes. Therefore, one can only imagine the honor that Death Guard Chaplain is held to. He has to be flexible and, at the same time unbreakable, being able to cater to the spiritual needs of his diverse chapter. How does one become a chaplain? Other than the fact that they're chosen from the Astartes that show the most unshakable faith in the Emperor and strength of character, we've also discussed a number of things about the chaplains. We've spoken about their great duties, their war gear, variants, and even their history and origin, but we've yet to talk about the process that one actually has to go through to become a chaplain of a Space Marine chapter. For a Space Marine to be even considered for the office of a chaplain, he must have earned a number of merit and devout badges. For the first step, an aspiring Astartes is chosen to be a novice or an initiate to the current chaplain of his company. He's then expected to aid the chaplain in performing his duties both on and off the battlefield. During this period, the novice is expected to become well-versed in the liturgies of the chapter under the guidance of his mentor. When the post of a chaplain becomes vacant for whatever reason, the most promising of these initiates are sent into a small cell called the Solitarium within the chapter's fortress monastery. There, they must remain in seclusion, meditating and fasting for a given time, which is unknown to them. During this time, if things progress smoothly, the reclusiarch and the Master of Sanctity prepare his investiture ceremony. When the preparations are complete, he is beckoned from his solitary confinement, given his symbols of office, and presented in front of the entire chapter to the company who will be under his guidance. The new chaplain then takes on the name of the one he's replacing. When a chaplain falls in battle, a formal ceremony, like the one mentioned, has to be put on halt. 
The chosen senior novice dons the war gear of his deceased predecessor and immediately takes up the role of the chaplain. His authority as one of the spiritual leaders of the chapter and the company he belongs to is immediately recognized. A formal investiture ceremony is only held once the battle is over and the final rites for the former chaplain are conducted. Notable Chaplains and Their Roles the Imperium has existed for thousands of millennia by now, and as such there's been enough time for several heroes of note to rise from within its rank. It's therefore not surprising that there's a number of chaplains who have left their mark upon their various chapters and the Imperium of Man. These are the names of some of the most notable chaplains and their roles. Ordo Cassius of the Ultramarines The current senior chaplain and the master of sanctity for arguably one of the greatest space marine chapters to exist, the Ultramarines, Orton Cassius is a legendary name. At this point, is about 400 years old, making him the oldest Ultramarine in existence who has not been interred into one of the venerable dreadnoughts. The old chaplain is a survivor of the First Tyrannic War, where he fought alongside the legendary Ultramarines chapter master Marnaeus Calgar against the Tyranids of Hive Fleet Behemoth. Orton was fortunate enough to survive the doomed rescue of the First Company from McCrag, despite coming out of it mortally wounded through sheer willpower. He kept himself alive long enough for the apothecaries to find him and center his broken body. Now, with most of his body parts replaced with bionic substitutes, Orton still leads his battle brothers into the battlefield, inspiring awe and wonder. Asmodai of the Dark Angels This legendary chaplain belongs to the interrogator chaplain order within the Dark Angels. Even amongst the intense individuals that hold this rank, Asmodai has earned a distinctly fierce reputation. He's considered their greatest interrogator, despite having only been able to make two fallen angels repent to date. It's stated that his quarry often kills themselves rather than be captured by him, which is only a matter of time once this chaplain sets his mind towards someone. This could be the reason behind his low count with regard to the fallen angels. Currently, he's undergone the brutal procedure to be become a Primaris Marine. Asmodai's single-minded obsession is a thing to be feared by his enemies, and he'll go to any length to add another Black Pearl to his Rosarius. Grimaldus of the Black Templars this living hero and chaplain of the Black Templar Space Marine chapter holds many distinctions. He is the Reclusiarch of the Black Templars, the hero of Hell's Reach and a veteran of the Third War of Armageddon. During the battle for Hive Hell's Reach, this legendary space marine led the defense of the Temple of Emperor Ascendant. Even as their defense was overrun and the building of the temple collapsed, burying its defenders, Grimaldus would emerge from the rubble and ruin holding three holy relics of the temple. This temple had existed since the early colonization of the Armageddon system and had housed the banner of the Emperor and the holy water from the stoop of elucidation. He emerged with both these relics, including a column from its major altar. The apothecaries who inspected him after his ordeal were shocked to find that he had the strength to climb out of those ruins, much less survive the wreckage. In honor of his heroics, the denizens of Hive Hell's Reach would grant him the title of the Hero of Hell's Reach. Carnarvon of the Flesh Terrors Belonging to the successor chapter of the Blood Angels known as the Flesh Terrors, Carnarvon shoulders the enormous burden of watching over his remaining 400 Blood Brothers. With most of them having fallen in battle while the rest succumbing to the Black Rage, which all the children of Sanguinus risk being afflicted by, he commemorates all of his fallen brothers in his long vigil. There were many whispered that having watched the slow fall of his chapter for nearly 250 years, it had taken a toll on his sanity. Like all Blood Angel chaplains, he had the ability to communicate with those afflicted by the flaws of Sanguinus. Carnarvon had the final say on who gets inducted into the Flesh Terrors, until his death on the planet of Baal, defending the homeworld of the Blood Angels from the Tyranid High Fleet Leviathan. The Martis of the Blood Angels We have yet another one of Sanguinus' sons who have made it into this list. The Martis is the leader of the Death Company, which is a band of Blood Angel Astartes who have been lost to the Black Rage. Under him, they've been transformed into a deadly fighting force, achieving things that were considered impossible. The biggest twist in his story is that Lamartis himself is afflicted by the Black Rage, but due to his immense willpower, he's able to control and prevent himself from completely losing himself to the affliction. Lamartis is placed into stasis every time his mission is completed and his talent are required once again. Lamartis has earned himself the moniker Guardian of the Lost, as he guides these lost souls into battle time and time again. He also wields the ancient Blood Causius, and all the enemies that witness this ancient weapon in front of them realize that their doom is nearby. He's given himself and these warriors a new lease on life and achieved deeds that can only be considered as legendary as the chaplain himself. Ulrich, the Slayer of the Space Wolf Ulrich is yet another supremely long-lived space marine who's held the position of the Wolf High Priest for more than 800 years. 
He's the oldest space wolf in existence, besides the chapter master Logan Grimnar, who's reigned for well over 500 years. To put things into perspective, Ulrich is old enough to remember Logan as a young initiate who showed a lot of promise for the future. He's considered the guardian of the space wolves and is referred to as Grandfather Lupus by his younger battle brothers. This ancient warrior is one of the oldest warriors in the Imperium to still function without being interred into a dreadnought. During the invasion by the traitorous Legion of Angron in the First War of Armageddon, Ulrich would earn great renown. In that battle, he'd single-handedly slay the three Cornate Berserkers who had managed to kill the leader of his company. Such would be fury in a battle that day that even Angron, the traitor Primarch, would grant him an uncharacteristic salute in acknowledgement. His deeds in that battle would earn him the nickname, The Slayer. Marvelous verdict. Although the office of the chaplain was born out of necessity to curb the psychers of the Imperium, and the credit for their origin lies with the heretical traitor Primarch Lorgar, since the events of the Horus Heresy, their importance to the current Imperium and the Adeptus Astartes cannot be overstated. In a world where humanity is beset on all sides by Xenos, mutants and servants of chaos, it can be a daunting task, even for superhuman beings such as the Space Marines. If not for the presence of the chaplains, rallying their battle brothers while facing the numerous horrors that had take the heart of even these mighty angels of Attribution, the Imperium would have suffered far greater losses than they currently have. For a chaplain, there's no difference between praying in the reclusium and slaying the foes of his emperor on the battlefield. In their eyes, battle is the greatest form of exaltation that they can offer to their emperor and primarch. From indoctrinating a young neophyte into the chapter to reciting the final rites of a fallen battle brother, a chaplain has perhaps the most diverse role in a space marine chapter. With the forces of chaos constantly seeking to enter the materium and spread their foul taint across the planes of reality, the job of a chaplain is more important than ever, as it's to make sure that the spiritual integrity of their chapter remains intact. It's their job to see that the dark whispers of the gods of chaos don't find their way into the ears of the Astartes under their charge, which would inevitably lead to the destruction of their entire chapter. If the Astartes are the last bastion of humanity against the Xenos, the mutants and the heretics, then the chaplains are the last bastion against the same for the Space Marines. We hope that with this video we were able to grant you insight into one of the coolest and ridiculously tough Space Marines to exist in the Warhammer 40k universe. They burn with the metaphorical fire of their faith in the Emperor, like beacons that give warmth and succor to their allies while setting the forces of darkness ablaze. If you enjoy our Warhammer 40k content, do let us know in the comments. Your support means the world to us, and we'd not be able to do this without you. We'll be back with another tale from the darkness of the 41st millennium soon. Until then, be sure to check out the rest of our videos on our channel. Be sure to stay safe out there. Peace.